precious Lamb of God, we worship you. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. okay it's a busy morning isn't it isn't that good don't you listen don't you like being involved we're a small church but don't you like being involved in a church that's busy it's active man I'm, I'm I grew up in a church um, where I slept most of the time there was nothing happening I got more out of sleeping. All right. I love you, church. I love the Lord, and I love what God is doing. The title of my message this morning is His Touch. His Touch. If you have your Bibles and you would turn with me to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, we're going to read verses 17, 18, and 19. If you could stand with me, too. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Oh, hello, Anna. I didn't see you there. Hi. Luke chapter 6. Verse 17. And he came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, God, by your Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to us what you would have us to know. Lord, that we would receive of you what you would have us to receive. And God, that your will would be done in this, uh, in this hour in your house. God, please, we pray that your name would be glorified, magnified, and exalted. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. His touch. His ministry was still in its infancy at this point. Jesus had just begun his public ministry. He was already quite popular by this time. In fact, as we read, Luke said that there was a great crowd that gathered. Uh, and he says, um, a great multitude of people out of Judea and Jerusalem from uh, the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to here. Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 4, verse 24, he talks about the fame that went through all Syria. So here is Jerusalem and all Syria. His fame is, is now reaching into great locations. Luke tells that the people came, where the people came from, uh, as well as Matthew. Matthew says from, uh, well, Luke says from Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and, uh, and Matthew says from Decapolis, from this area, and you, you could see that his fame is spreading. People, listen, uh, Judea stretched out 60 miles south of Jerusalem. Matthew give, gives his account, Matthew chapter 4, verse 25. Galilee stretches out about 100 miles north. Decapolis about 100 miles east. So you're talking about m more than 100 mile radius from Jerusalem. These people traveled to hear him preach and for listen listen to what they what the writer says for his touch they traveled a great distance for his touch Amen. there were no planes and trains and automobiles in those days no mass transit no shuttle service people would come from over a hundred miles by camel mule horse uh, by tom mccann's <laughs> Tom McCann's, unfortunately, they don't make those anymore. Good, cheap shoes that lasted a long time. 
But they, they traveled by foot. They traveled long distances. When we were in Cuba, and we're going to see it again, when we were in Cuba preaching, these people traveled from, from villages and towns and cities at a great distance. They rode bicycles. They rode mules. They took carriages. They walked. They found a way to come and worship God. They couldn't fit in the church, and so we had services outside. Three churches gathering. It's hot. It's miserable hot and humid. And yet these people traveled from miles uh, any way they could to come into the house of God to worship God. And they don't go home until it's over. <laughs> when is it over? After God has been thoroughly glorified in praise and worship. After the sermon has been preached. And then after every person has been prayed for. Then the, and you know there are other countries, you've seen it around the world, where people come, they, and this is, they came from great distances to come, and for this one purpose, for his touch, to touch him, or to be touched by him. And they came to be touched. And the Bible says, for there went virtue out of him. Let me tell you about that touch this morning. Are you with me? Amen. Let's take a look at that touch this morning. Virtue flowed out of him, the gospel writer says. The word in the original Greek language is dunamis, power, dynamite, dynamo, dynamic. All words that represent power. Out of him flowed power. Power for what? Healing. What do you need? What do you need? Power flowed out of them. They just wanted a touch. And some were healed. And others were delivered. Power. What, what, pow what kind of power was involved in his touch? What do you need? First of all, it was a healing touch. There was power to heal. We've got the picture here. You've seen it a bunch of times. I I'll just say uh, both Matthew and Mark tell of this woman... Mark 5, 25 through 34, and Luke 8, 43 through 48. A woman with a bleeding disorder, hemorrhaging for 12 years. Now, the only, I understand the, the, the portrait, the painting, it, uh, uh, it, it shows her touching the hem of, of the master's garment. And if we were ever able to get a photograph, we never would have seen her because of the great crowd. Okay, so I understand. Just, just imagine there are people thronging him so that you can't see this woman. She's, in, she's crawling on her hands and knees. She's reaching through the crowd to touch him. Why? Because she has this bleeding disorder for 12 years. The Bible says that she had exhausted her resources. In fact, if you look at what the scripture said, she spent all that she had on treatments, and she suffered many things of many physicians. In other words... People were taking advantage of her. Whatever her substance was, we don't know. We don't know how rich she was, but after 12 years of seeing every doctor, I imagine she checked out every quack, every, every resource, every opportunity. If she heard about somebody who can do something for her, she was there until she had exhausted her resources, until there was nothing left, no one else to call, nobody else to visit, nobody else to rely upon. She had lost everything, and she is now destitute. People were taking advantage of her. I'm sure there were some snake oil salesmen trying to sell her some new fad. And the woman is desperate. Listen, though, I'm, I'm going to explain something. She was desperate. In her desperation, she would try anything. Not only was this a physical condition, but it was also a social condition. Leviticus chapter 15. A, a, a woman in her, uh, in her cycle was considered unclean. A woman, this woman was hemorrhaging for 12 years, unclean, could not for 12 years go to be in the community, go shopping amongst her friends, couldn't go to church, to temple, to, 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 to the sanctuary, the house of God, because she was unclean, couldn't go out with her family. She was unclean, ceremonially unclean. Could you imagine? And, and after 12 years, don't you think people, the word would have gotten out? Don't you think people would have known her? 
So now, if she comes to, to a crowd, Jesus is there, they're obviously going to know who she is. But this woman has exhausted every possible opportunity. All of her resources are gone, and she is not yet healed. She's sick, and she's ceremonially unclean, according to Jewish law, and she was desperate. Have you ever been desperate? Desperate. I've done everything. I've tried everything, and I'm desperate. Listen to me. Please don't misunderstand me. I know people who will have a prayer meeting over a headache. That's fine. According to your faith, be it unto you. If you have a headache and, uh, and, and you, just, you just believe God, you're going to believe God for your healing, that's wonderful. That's fine. That's fine. That's great. If you're healed, that's a wonderful thing. If you're suffering with that headache, t take a Motrin. Take a Tylenol. I'm just going to be honest with you. I get a headache. I go right to the cabinet. I grab my Motrin. Headache's gone. And I go about my merry business. You with me? I'm good. I got Motrin. You say, well, that's not. You have no faith. No, I got a lot of faith. I got faith in Motrin. <laughs> God gave some scientist the, the thought and the ability to create um, uh, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, you know, and, and the headache is gone, and, I'm, and I go about my merry business happy. But, friends, when, what I'm talking about is desperate when there, you have, you've exhausted your resources. There's no Motrin to take. There's no acetaminophen to take. There's no aspirin. There's no anything. There's no doctor. There's no lawyer. There's no one or nothing. You've tried everything, and the situation is there. I'm talking desperate. That's this woman. There is no other resource. They're all exhausted, and the condition persists. It's still there. Now, I know we, we call, we say this woman is desperate, and she is. But she's not desperate where she says, I've tried everything else, I might as well try Jesus. Listen to me, hear me. That's, that's not what the text points to. That's not the picture we're to get from this. She has faith. She has desperate faith. She's desperate because she tried everything else and she knows the answer is not there. But she knows that Jesus is the answer. You follow me? It's not out of sheer desperation. She has, has, has exhausted all resources, resources and here comes the only one who can heal her. And there's not anything that's going to stop her. I don't care what the people say. I don't care if they arrest me. Because by the way, this is equal to assault. She's unclean ceremonially, and she's going to go out into the community, and she's going to touch this famous rabbi. You're going to get, you're going to get at least put in jail, or worse. This is, this is, you might as well go spit in his face. Literally, it would, be, it would be considered an assault for an unclean person to reach through. And to, but she said, you know what, I don't care. I don't care about the ramifications of this. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what they do. I've got to touch him. I've got to touch him. I know if I could touch him, then I will be healed. And she, ri she risked everything that she had to touch him. See, friends, when we reach our limits, man's extremity is God's opportunity. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said this. J.B. Phillips has been accredited. E.G. White, I don't know who said it originally. Somebody said it. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. When you've reached your extremity, when you've exhausted all of your resources, when there's nobody else to call and nobody else to turn to and no other solution, friends, listen, I... I I, let me just move on. When you, I grew up a survivor. There's a way. There's always a way, right? There's always a way. You find the way. What happens when, when there is no way? When you, when you can't, there, you've tried everything and there's nothing left. 
she reaches through, she, she crawls through. That's why I say this, this, that painting, as beautiful as it is in the, in the picture that it paints, but she's, there's a great crowd. She has to reach through. She's, she's getting stepped on, perhaps, by others. She's going to reach through and, and touch the hem of his, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. Be prepared for a miracle. When you get to that place, be prepared for a miracle. Listen, friends, and you know me. I'm not a hyper-faith person. But when are we going to believe the word of God? When are we going to embrace the word of God and live the word of God? I'm expecting God to move because he's God. Anybody else awake? I'm expecting God to move because he hasn't changed. He's still God. He's dynamic. Lord, you're the only one who could help me now. I put my life into your hands. God expects something to happen. Listen, an unclean woman, I went through that. If I could just touch the, his robe, I know I'll be healed. I, I don't care what anybody says or anybody thinks, I've got to do it. And you know, think about this. None of these people who would stand to judge me have been able or willing to help me anyway. I don't care. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. And she was healed. I don't know where I am on slides. Probably back there. Listen. She was healed. Do you believe God heals today? Do you believe in the dunamis, the power of God, the virtue of God, of Christ to heal today? I know I've shared this before. I, I often repeat myself. Uh, but just let me tell you. It was a 4.30 prayer meeting. 4.30 prayer meeting on a Sunday. That's between Sunday morning and Sunday night. Because... We used to have church on Sunday all day. We went to church on Sunday morning, and then we came back for a 4.30 prayer meeting Sunday afternoon, and then we stayed there until the Sunday evening service. Just let that think, sink in for a moment. It was in a 4.30 prayer meeting that Richard Dunning and his wife brought their little boy, who had been born about now, he's probably 18 months, maybe two years old, he has braces on both legs and the boy can't walk. I don't know the condition. The doctor said that he will never walk without braces. I, again, I don't know what the condition is, but the prognosis, he will never walk without braces. And so at 4.30, Don, Pastor Don Evans, Reverend Marvin McCarthy, I don't remember who else was there. I was there. I was just w with them praying. Um, and th we gathered around this little boy and we prayed for him. And then we... W put him aside and we went on to pray for other people and this little boy crawls over to the front pew he stands up gets up on his elbows and starts walking they take him to the doctor the doctor says we don't understand what happened we there's no explanation to this at all they removed his uh, his braces and just prior to us coming here 13 years ago uh, the Dunning boy was had just enlisted in the Marine Corps tell me God doesn't heal. Don't tell me he's not able to heal. Don't tell me. You can't tell me because I've seen it. A, a visiting minister, I won't say who he is. You know who, you might know who he was. He's fallen, but he came to visit the church. It was a two-day crusade. Um, maybe Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't remember. But uh, he was there, and, and he had asked the crowd, he said, does anybody need a healing? Does anybody need a touch? And a young man raised his hand and said, yes, I do. And uh, he said, come on up. What's your problem? He said, I was born deaf in one ear, deaf in one ear from birth. Okay, before he prays for him, he asks the, co the congregation, does anybody know this man? And one of, my, one of the young adults, one of my friends said, yes, I brought him. I asked him to come. Okay, could you confirm that he is deaf? This is before anything. Yes, yeah, we, I've worked with him for years. He's deaf in one ear. Everybody knows that. Okay. He prays for the young man to receive his hearing, and the, the, he says, could you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. He starts to weep. Can you hear me? And so he goes, so he goes across the other side of, of the, uh, this, the altar. He pulls the microphone away. He says, can you cover your good ear? Can you hear me now? Yes. And the tears start flowing. He starts running around the church healed. I 
Don't tell me God doesn't heal. My mother, you know, uh, she's 82 years old, you know, maybe two and a half, three months ago. Uh, I asked the church to pray for her. She had, she had pain. She could barely walk. The doctor said after a quarter zone shot that didn't work, uh, you're going to have to have your hip replaced. She's had both knees replaced. You're going to have to have your hip replaced. There's no answer. She can barely walk. So we pray. She goes to her church. She goes to a little church now in Stratford. There's about 25 people on a Sunday morning. And Pastor Fudge, who I've not yet met, but Pastor Fudge lays hands on her and prays. And the pain in her hip left her. And that's been, I just talked to her two days ago, yesterday, in fact. She's got other issues. <laughs> but the pain is completely gone from her hip. Never has it come. Now this is two and a half, three months. My family will confirm. Healed. No, doesn't need a hip replacement. Don't tell me God doesn't heal. Don't tell me that there isn't virtue that flows from Christ to heal today. Amen. Amen. Some of you believe it. This woman said, I know he is the answer. I know if I touch him, it's the touch. I know I'll be healed. It was a rescuing touch. Matthew 14, Jesus comes to his disciples. They're, they're, they're out in the ship. The storm comes. There's waves and wind, and they're, you know, they're freaking out. They're afraid for their lives. And uh, Jesus comes walking on the water. There's a whole story there. I love to preach it. He, he, he told them he would meet them at the other side. So if they only believed, they didn't have to worry. But they're scared. The storm is there, they're, they're being tossed around, and Jesus comes walking on the water. And at first they're afraid, at first they think it's a phantom, a ghost. And he says, it is I, be not afraid. And then Peter, you got to love Peter. <laughs> Peter. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, let me come, bid me come. And Jesus says, well, come on, Peter. So Peter steps up out of the boat. You got to love Peter. I love Peter because I could relate to him so well at this stage of his life. <laughs> Later on, he becomes a great man of God. But I could relate to Peter at this stage in his life. Always says the wrong thing. Always speaks out of turn. Uh, doesn't think before he speaks. Uh, but he's trying. Peter, I love Peter because he's trying desperately to be what God wants him to be. He's trying desperately to obey and believe. And so he says, if Jesus, if, you're, if you can walk on the water and you let me, then I'm coming too. And so he steps out of, the, out of the boat and he begins to walk. And, and I don't, could you imagine? I, it's windy. It's waves. He's probably, I don't know, stepping, I don't know if he's stepping on the waves or stepping over the waves. You just, I, I just love to try and get a picture of this. But he's walking. He's doing it. He's, his eyes are on Jesus. He's, he's looking. And, and I can only, only imagine, could you, could you imagine Jesus standing there like a, I could picture him like a father with his hands out. Come on. Come on, Peter. You got this. You, come on, Peter, you can do this, come on. And Peter's doing it, step by step, however long. I, and then all of a sudden he begins to, hey, I can't do this. You see those waves? Man, there's waves here, there's, there's wind here. But, but you don't, people, don't, people don't walk on water, I can't do this. And he begins to consider the circumstances. You know you've heard this preach a thousand times. But he's considering the circumstances that he's in rather than the one who said, you could come to me. You could make it. You're going to be okay, Peter. No, he takes his eyes off of Christ and he begins to consider the circumstances. And then that's when he began to sink. And he began to sink. Listen, Peter's a great guy. There's only one problem. He's very human. <laughs> he... Listen, when he first stepped out to follow Jesus, he was doing okay. It's amazing the changes he makes in our lives when we first step out to follow him. Do you remember those days? You remember way back when? Do you remember? I, I remember when I, when I came to Christ, when I first started to follow him, I remember the, the, the change was instantaneous on the inside. It took a while to it took a while to come to fruition on the outside. But it was very real, it was very instant, and I couldn't believe the changes that God was making in the way I saw things, the way I felt about things, the way I felt about others, the way I felt about myself, about my about life, about death, about everything. It's amazing when we first start 
to, to step out and we first start walking. We're walking on water. Do you remember that? Praise God, my sin's forgiven. Heaven's awaiting me. I'm, we're doing fine. We begin to walk. But all too often we begin to look more at the circumstances and less on Jesus. And that will always cause us our demise. I can't do this. See, friends, listen to me. If our victory were left up to us, we would all drown. If my victory, if my ability to traverse this life and to one day walk through the gates of pearl, through that narrow gate, if it were left up to me, if it were up to me alone, I would be destroyed. I would have been destroyed long ago, and I would never, ever make it. My hope is not in my ability to make it through. My hope is not in my ability to hang on to Jesus. My hope is his ability to hang on to me. And the Bible says that none are going to pluck me from his hands. Amen. We've got to put our faith and our confidence in him. Listen, so Peter begins to drown. He begins to sink because he's looking at the circumstances rather than on Jesus. And Jesus reaches forth his hand and rescues Peter like he rescues us. He took, us, he took him by the hand. He took, takes us by the hand. This reminds me of another story in the Bible. Genesis chapter 13 and uh, verses, uh, chapter, chapters 13 through 19. You still with me? Amen. Genesis 13 through 19, the chapters. Abraham and his nephew Lot. They're traveling together. Abraham's looking out for his, his nephew. Uh, they're, they're two clans. Um, they're growing. The, the land cannot contain them. I don't want to get too graphic, but it's not just that there's not enough. Their, their cattle are growing. Their animals are growing. Their family's growing. So there's not enough food. The land is not able to produce enough food. And then there's water conditions. And then there's sewage conditions to consider. And there's, they're overwhelmed. The land is overwhelmed by the vast number of people. And so Abraham says, we've got to split up. We can't, we, we're not going to survive unless we split up. There's just too, too many people for the land. And so he gives Lot the choice. Which, which, which do you want? And Lot chooses the plains. Oh, they're beautiful. Beautiful plains. Nice sunshine. The only problem with that is it's in the vicinity of the city of Sodom. Sodom already has a reputation. Well-deserved reputation from being perverse. For being disgusting. And, uh, and but... He's not in Sodom. He's in the plains. He chose the plains. He pitched his tent, it says, toward Sodom. He, 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 he started, he's just looking in the vicinity of Sodom, but, but he's not in the city. He's just, he just chose that direction. But there is the allurement. There is the, how could you live so close to such an uh, infamous city and not at least be curious? So whether it's out of curiosity or, I don't know, all lost in his own heart. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but we find out that, that now this righteous man is not only uh, parked outside of Sodom, but now he is in Sodom. And Peter, in 2 Peter 2.7, reports to us that he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, the ungodly deeds. He vexed his righteous soul. He still... He's a righteous man. He's a child of God. He's a descendant of Abraham. Uh, but he's in Sodom, and Sodom got on him. He, now his judgment was perverted. He, he's given an opportunity. You know the story, the angels of the Lord, I believe the pre-incarnate Christ and two angels, Come and visit Abraham, and Abraham intercedes. They're saying, they, we're going to go, we're going we're to destroy Sodom. And Abraham intercedes, if there's 50, if there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 10 righteous, would you spare the city? And the Lord says, for the sake of 10, I'll spare the city, um, if I can find 10. <laughs> and, and so now the two angels go into the city to rescue Lot and his family. They're, Lot is told that judgment is coming. He is told that judgment is going to be poured out and he's given an opportunity to run. But he is, he is so vexed, so polluted from the environment in which he lives that he can't make an intelligent decision. 
and he stays. The Bible says that he lingered. He stayed behind. Friends, he, it was Sodom that had polluted his mind. The angels came to take him away, but he would not. Listen, you, you, you know, I've given you this illustration before you've heard. You got a pecan pie in your refrigerator or chocolate cake or whatever, ganolis, ganoles, whatever it is that you love. They're in the refrigerator and you can't wait to have them. You can't wait. You thought about them all day long. You're going to get home from work, skip dinner, you eating the cannolis. The problem is there's mystery meat in the back of the refrigerator. You know that stuff that's wrapped up in the aluminum foil? It's been there a while. Everybody just passes it by in the house. You know it's something that shouldn't be there anymore, but nobody want, nobody's brave enough to open it up and throw it out. It's mystery meat. You find out it's rotten pork chops or chicken. For some reason, that's nasty. Fish. Something in the back. You can't figure it out, but it's been there hanging out with your pecan pie. And you open up the wrapper of the pecan pie, you can't wait, you threw this stuff out, but now you sit down to eat the pie, and when you take the fork to your, you, what, you smell that stuff. It's absorbed the odor. It's not the rotten pork chop, but it certainly smells like it. And now you've lost the appetite, because as much as you want to taste pecan pie, you're tasting the rotten pork chops. It's been, see, it's been, it's been violated, it has been vexed, it has, it has been polluted by its environment. And how often, friends, do we get polluted by our environment? We were once on fire for God. We never would have looked at Sodom. But, but now we've allowed ourselves to be drawn to that place. And we've hung out in Sodom long enough that now Sodom has gotten on us. And, and now when the opportunity is given to be set free, we're, we linger. We're reluctant. We're reluctant. Listen, did I, did I say that if, if victory were left up to me, I would be destroyed? But listen to what the angel of the Lord does. The angels take Lot by his hand and say, righteous man, come up out of there and take him. It was, it was a touch, a rescuing touch that took out Lot and his family and brought them up out of Sodom. Are you with me? Amen. The angels reach. Friends, it was a rescuing touch. Do you need to be rescued today? Do you need to be rescued? Has Sodom gotten on you? Have you, by, because of your environment, have you gotten to the place where you say, I was once on fire. Lord, re Lord, start the fire. As we sang this morning, Lord, rekindle the fire that once burned so bright and so clear. Maybe you need to be touched. Maybe you need a touch from heaven today to be rescued. It was a life-giving touch. Jesus comes to the city named Nain. The first thing he sees is a funeral procession. It happened to be the only son of a widow. Now we, we don't think too much of that these days, but here is a widow, um, and her only son is very much dead. That in itself is a tragedy. That in itself is a terrible loss. I can't imagine the pain that one would suffer from that. But how hopeless was this, was this situation? Not only is his life gone, but she's left alone. She is, as the Bible calls, a widow indeed. There is no husband, there's no ex-husband, there's no family to provide. Her son, her only son, was her only hope, and now he's gone. And now she's going to either need to beg or worse. To make a, how is she going to provide? How is she going to sustain her life? Her situation, friends, is absolutely hopeless. There's no one left to care for her or provide for her, and she would now become a beggar or worse. How many hopeless situations exist today? Maybe it's not, maybe it's not the same. Maybe it's not the, exactly there. But how many hopeless situations exist today? Maybe even a few represented here this morning. It might not be physical death that you face, but your situation is every bit as hopeless. You are, for all intents and purposes, left alone to deal with your problem. Your resources are, are exhausted. There is no one, if there was a phone number you could call, you would, but you've exhausted all that. There's nobody else. 
There's no one you can call. There's no agency. There's no, there's no resources. And as you sit there this morning, all hope is gone. Your situation seems every bit hopeless. It could be that you realize the hopelessness of your sin. You realize that I'm, I'm buried in sin. I've offended God. I don't know God. If I were to die today, see, that, that's a real fear a lot of people have if they take the moment to think about it. What is this life going to, what is going to be of me? What's going to happen to me when this life is over? I'm getting older. There's all kinds of dangers that surround us. There's sicknesses. There's accidents that happen. We all know people that, that have passed away. You say, well, one day it's going to happen to me. No one gets out of here alive. What, what is, maybe today your situation feels hopeless because you know if you stood before God, you couldn't give an account for your life. Maybe your situation is that of being buried in your sin. It could be that you realize that. The Bible tells us that we're all dead in our trespasses and sin, and the wages of sin are death. We're all left absolutely alone in a very hopeless situation as it relates to our sin. Of course, outside of Christ. See, friends, it's His touch. It's His touch. Jesus was moved with compassion, and He stopped the funeral procession and he laid his hands on the, on the pyre, on the coffin, on the casket, on, and, he, and he raised the child. Life came back into a hopeless situation, and the, and the boy stood, sat up, and he was, he was made whole. Life came into that dead body. Hope came into that hopelessness. It was his touch. It was his life-giving touch. Listen, as we, as we close, if time permitted... We could talk about the, the cleansing touch, how he healed leprosy. We could talk about the quieting touch, how he calmed the inner turmoil of those who were demon-possessed and cast the devil out. We could talk about the illuminating touch, which opened blinded eyes. We could talk about the reassuring touch that gave confidence and hope. We could talk about the liberating touch. We could talk about many uh, of, of the touch of Christ this morning. We asked as we started out, what power was in that touch? What touch do you need? What touch do you need? What power do you need this morning? Jesus, friends, is moved with compassion towards us all. Listen, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby we perceive Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Well, the crowd came from over a hundred miles in radius for his touch. For his touch. Do you need a touch this morning? Maybe there's a need only God could meet. Only you would know. Perhaps you're aware of your sin which separates you from God and you need a touch of salvation. Maybe you're, it's a hopeless situation you face. You've tried everything else. You've called everybody. You have no resources to meet this. You need, you need him. Listen. Let him touch you this morning. Like the woman who pressed in, the woman with the issue of blood who, who pressed in, who realized her situation was hopeless, there was nobody else. Press in this morning. But pastor, I, I, I prayed last week. I came to the altar. I prayed last week. You laid hands on me. You anointed me. And, and, and I ha there's nothing, nothing's happened. I, do, people will think that I have no faith. I couldn't care less what anybody thought. People might think I don't have enough faith. Don't care. I have a need. I don't care what anybody says. You judge all you want. The people who will stand to judge you can't help you anyway. But there is one who can. And there is only one who can. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And maybe you need to just press in and touch the hem of his garment. Can I just say one thing? Because I'm going to ask you to come to, an alt to the altar. I'm not going to lay hand. We're not going to anoint you with oil unless you ask for it. But you I just want you to come and press in to touch the hem of his garment. 
But let me just tell you this. In, uh, in, 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 my, in the testimony of miracles that I've seen and people healed, I had a brother who's now in heaven who had brain surgery. And for 20-something years, almost 30 years, he had been comatose for months, and then he had been paralyzed for many, many years. Uh, 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 bed sores and, and, and restricted. He was, he was an absolute mess physically. And we, we prayed for him. I know pastors, I, pastors of every kind of church imaginable came, anointed him with oil, prayed every prayer there's a, you could possibly pray over him, and year after year, he never got healed. You say, well, pastor, you just blew it. I was with you on this, but you blew it. I, my brother got saved. I got saved. My mother got saved. My family's my kids are saved. My wife's saved. Well, she was saved anyway, but... I'm saying his family got saved, people got, people got saved, people are getting saved, all, as a, all because, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't. Ain't that cool? Ain't that cool that it doesn't have to make sense that God is able to do as he will with our lives? Listen, I don't know the outcome. I don't know, the, I don't know what he's going to do for you. I don't know. I can't. I don't have that ability to know. I just know this. I know that there is virtue that flows from Christ. I know that there is power that flows from Christ today, here, right now, in the midst of his church. I know that God wants to be glorified by his people. I know that if we will only reach through and touch the hem of his garment, that he will do something for someone. I know that. Amen. Do you believe that he's able this morning? Do you believe? What? need do you have that nobody can help I can't help you I wish I could if I could help you I would give you everything I can to help you I can't but I know who can so come to him come to him like you were like you were the woman on her knees come to him like you realize that only his touch is the answer come to him would you come to him would you come to the altar he, he's here this morning you said that he'll be here amongst us is there anybody who'll say, I'm pressing in this morning. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care about the time. I don't care what, what, what I look like. I don't care. I'm pressing in. Because I know that only he can. I know he, he can. Your situation is hopeless otherwise. I am so glad this morning, church, that I don't have to be responsible for, for your victory. I don't, you don't have to be responsible for your victory. We serve a God who has made himself responsible. Who said, if you'll come to me, come to me. He'll meet our needs. He will meet us at our place of need. And we have this assurance. Friends, either the word of God is true or we throw the whole thing out. He said, if we gather in his name, he's in the midst of us. And he said, whatever we agree upon as touching in his name would be given to us. Do you believe? Press in this morning. Jesus. Lord Jesus. My God, my God, my God, you who are present, Lord, here as you have always been amongst your church. You, Lord, who are present here, Father, to meet us at our hopeless place. God, only you know the hearts of these people. You know the desperation, Lord. Father, I will no, no way make a mockery out of this. God, it is, it, is, it is you, Lord. They're reaching out to you, Master. We are reaching out to you, Lord, in our circumstances that are beyond our ability, God, because we know, Lord, that you are able. We know that you are able, Lord, and we know, Father, that you are willing to meet us at our would place you, of Would need. you stand with me, please? And as right where you are, would you turn around and greet somebody, shake somebody's hand.
Praise the Lord. Praise God. Good morning. Praise the Lord. We serve a mighty God who is worthy of our highest praise. Let's worship him together this morning.